From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Okay, folks, this evening I want to talk a few minutes about uh, meningitis. Basically, meningitis is the inflammation of the membranes that uh, surround the brain and spinal cord. And meningitis could be caused by different organisms, most commonly bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. And these organisms, they reach the central nervous system by hematogenous spread, or many times even by direct entrance from contiguous sites. And in neonates, whenever the maternal pathway, the birth canal is infected with group B streptococcus or the simplex, the babies could get this from the mother while passing through the birth canal, that's a possibility. And a direct inoculation can occur from trauma, skull defects when there is this uh, CSF leak and many times even with uh, malformations. Now bacterial meningitis typically it occurs whenever there is a bacterial penetration of the blood-brain barrier and it's, it, it causes intense immunological response and many times the, it, it could lead to very very fatal consequences even coma and death. Now let's see clinical presentation. Symptoms commonly associated with uh, both bacteria and uh, viral meningitis, they many times they overlap, they present with fever, headache, neck stiffness and we call it meningismus, photophobia, confusion, and symptoms commonly associated with uh, both bacterial and viral meningitis. They overlap. So remember those symptoms, fever, headache, neck stiffness, that is uh, meningismus, photophobia, confusion. Bacterial meningitis, it can cause significant morbidity like neurological sequela, particularly sensory neural hearing loss, and uh, many times if you do not treat them with antibiotic therapy, these people will die. And in viral meningitis, basically you give them supportive treatment. Now, clinical presentation of bacterial and viral meningitis may be indistinguishable just by uh, the clinical symptoms. Then you go for laboratory testing, cerebrospinal fluid leukocyte pleocytosis, Pleocytosis is basically white blood cells in cerebrospinal fluid. That pleocytosis, that increased level of uh, white blood cells in the cerebrospinal fluid, that is pleocytosis, that is the hallmark of meningitis. Pleocytosis could be two types, lymphocytic and neutrocytic. Bacterial, bacterial meningitis is generally characterized by neutrophilic pleocytosis, that is predominance of polymorphonuclear neutrophils in the cerebrospinal fluid. And common causes of lymphocytic pleocytosis are viral meningitis and uh, like West Nile virus. Even fungal infections can cause uh, uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis. Spirochetal infections like uh, Lyme disease can cause lymphocytic pleocytosis. Non-infectious uh, causes like uh, cancer connective tissue disease and hypersensitivity reactions to drugs can also cause lymphocytic pleocytosis. <coughs> so the point is when you absorb cerebrospinal fluid in these patients, you can differentiate based on elevation. Now bacterial pleocytosis, bacterial meningitis, there are three things you need to remember. It is like if you take a, a gram stain, it will be positive. Uh, protein levels will be increased, glucose level will be decreased. So protein level is increased, glucose level is decreased and uh, they also give you uh, a gram positive state. So remember those three things uh, folks, those are very very important points. Glucose level decreases in bacterial meningitis because bacteria uses those uh, glucose levels. Now let me talk a few minutes about uh, the etiology, the microbiology of bacterial meningitis, especially in the United States. 
Now, following the introduction of uh, Haemophilus conjugate, like if Haemophilus influenza conjugate vaccine, the meningitis due to Haemophilus influenza dramatically decreased in pediatric population. Almost it is eliminated uh, by this vaccine. I mean, there are people who refuse vaccines and they are still having this problem, but mostly it is gone. And the bacterial agents causing the problem it depends on age in infants in younger than like three months the most common cause are group B streptococcus listeria and E. coli so that's a very important point in younger than three months the three most common things are E. coli, listeria, group B streptococcus those are the three most common causes of meningitis from three months to 18 years streptococcus pneumonia and an Neisseria meningitis those are the most common causes H. influenza can also happen in non-vaccinated children. So from 3 months to 18 years, streptococcus pneumonia and Neisseria meningitis, they are the most common causes with influenza uh, being a concern in non-immunized children. Then 18 years to 50 years, streptococcus pneumonia and Neisseria meningitis. And also in the elderly, you need to think of uh, Listeria because uh, their immunity levels falls. Now, there are additional bacteria that must be considered based on the case presentation. For example, it is a post neurosurgery patient. You need to think of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In patients with uh, ventricular shunts, you need to think of uh, Staphylococcus aureus or gram-negative bacilli. And in pregnant patients, you need to think of Listeria. So remember that point, folks. Pregnant patients with meningitis, you need to think of uh, Listeria. And other things like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also common, especially causing uh, chronic uh, meningitis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, fungi like uh, coccidioides, cryptococcus neoformans, spirochetes like uh, Treponema pallidum. And they can also cause um, uh, a chronic form of uh, meningitis. Lyme disease can cause a chronic form of meningitis. So these organisms, they can be found when you do the culture on CSF. And they require special serologic or molecular diagnostic techniques. Most cases of bacterial meningitis, and they start with bacterial colonization of nasopharynx. Very important point. They stay in the nose. So the bacterial colonization of nasopharynx, from there, it goes into the brain. And the exception, is Listeria. Listeria enters the blood through contaminated food. So that's an important point. Listeria enters the bloodstream through ingestion of contaminated food. Now, pathologic bacteria such as Streptococcus pneumonia and uh, Neisseria meningitis, they secrete uh, IgA protease that inactivates host antibody and facilitates mucosal attachment. You see, the body fights off these infections by complement pathway and immunological pathway. So Neisseria meningitis especially it binds with the non-ciliated epithelial cells using its finger-like projections called pili. And Neisseria meningitis binds to these epithelial cells with, with those finger-like projections and slowly it enters the brain. And it protects itself with a, uh, with a capsule. When they, I mean, even when you use antibiotics in some patients, these Neisseria meningitis, they can actually uh, have those capsules which are very, very resistant to breakthrough. So you need to use very powerful antibiotics when bacterial meningitis happens because they go in and they wreak havoc. Once they cross the blood-brain barrier, I mean, the body has to fight hard to stop them. So you see, what you need to understand is uh, different age groups have different predilection of bacterial meningitis. The easiest way is to make them groups, birth to 3 months, 3 months to 18 years, 18 years to 50 years. So if you make that classification, it's easy to remember them. Otherwise, everything becomes like mumbo-jumbo, confused and uh, chaotic. And patients with uh, splenectomy, uh, they, they are particularly vulnerable to pneumococcal meningitis because they cause that uh, um, 
I mean, when the body has no immunological uh, capacity to stop these infections, these bacterial infections, they, they control, I mean, they complement components, the C5 to C9, and uh, whenever there is disruption in that mechanism, the body cannot fight off these infections. And they can also cause sensorineural hearing loss in children with H. influenza meningitis. That's why we use corticosteroids to prevent the sensorineural hearing loss. Now let us see a few minutes about uh, clinical manifestations. Among patients uh, who develop community-acquired bacterial meningitis, they usually have upper respiratory infection. So first upper respiratory tract infection, then meningitis. In some patients they will have neurosurgery, then meningitis. And in some patients trauma, CSF leak, then as a consequence they are at risk for meningitis. And in uh, infants who are infected as they pass through maternal birth canal, they are at risk for group B streptococcus meningitis and herpes simplex meningitis. So even for a newborn baby, if he has pneumonia, sorry, meningitis, you need to think about uh, the risk factors that are coming from the mother because uh, they actually uh, are the most common risk factors. Group B streptococcus in the newborn baby. Now, let us see the clinical manifestations. As I said, favor, the neck stiffness, there are two things you need to remember in the signs, Brodzinski sign and the Kernexo sign. Kernexo sign is like a resistance to passive extension of the flexed leg with the patient lying supine. And Brodzinski sign is an involuntary flexion of the hip and the knee when you passively flex the patient's neck. So when you flex the patient's neck, he will flex his uh, hip and the knee. So that is a uh, Brodzinski sign. So remember those two signs, Brodzinski sign and Kernix sign. They are very characteristic, but you should not rely upon them to make a diagnosis because not every patient with meningitis will present with those signs. Same with mental confusion. Not every patient with uh, meningitis will come with uh, mental confusion. Some of them you probably think they are just normal. So you cannot say Brodzinski sign is negative and uh, Kernix sign is negative, so this patient doesn't have meningitis because meningitis can happen even without those signs. The other trait you need to remember is a Cushing's trial. It has three things, bradycardia, hypertension, and respiratory depression. That is a Cushing's trial. So it happens when the brainstem compression due to herniation. So bradycardia, respiratory depression, hypertension. These three things are uh, you see in Cushing's supply. And any patient suspected of having meningitis, you need to immediately do emergent lumbar puncture for gram stain and culture of the cerebrospinal fluid. And then you need to immediately start them on antibiotics. So that's very important, folks, that the most important thing in the management. Any patient suspected of having meningitis, they require emergent lumbar puncture for gram stain and culture of the cerebrospinal fluid, and then you should immediately start them on antibiotics. So, and corticosteroids also, because corticosteroids, they prevent the sensory neural hearing loss that is associated with the certain meningitis. Now, what about uh, the other stuff? Like sometimes uh, meningitis patients can also have brain abscess. And when you suspect brain abscess, I mean, if you see a brain abscess on CD scan, they also need aggressive treatment like IV antibiotics. So when you see the meningitis, Think of uh, the etiology, what is the age of the patient, what is the clinical history of the patient, and then think of the etiological organism based on the age. And if you go by most common organisms, the probability of finding them is very, very high. Because if you make rare diagnosis, you are rarely correct. But if you are 
go for a most common cause, the probability of finding the correct diagnosis is very, very high. So those are the things I wanted to share with you this uh, evening about meningitis. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.